So hi everyone. Uh, in today's talk, you know, I'm going to talk about how we can enhance Java security and performance with the help of Rust. So how can we integrate Rust into Java in order to gain advantage of Rust into our code base? So you might ask, okay, why should I do that? If you work in industry or you work as a senior engineer for years, you might actually come across a lot of situation that you have a large code base from 10, 20 years ago. It has been written in all in Java. There are a lot of libraries and your team is responsible to add some feature or remove some feature or find some security issue or do some stuff like that. And uh, <clears throat> you simply can't just release, you know, and get that, uh, throw away your Java code and just say, okay, I write everything from uh, scratch in Rust because of the security of performance. So you might need certain, you know, capabilities from other languages, in this case, Rust, and you want to see how you can integrate that, bring it to your language, bring it to your code base. Here is Java. So I'm going to talk about that. So in this talk, you know, first I'm gonna a little bit give you introduction about Rust, what is the security model, and then I talk about common issues in Java, distinction between Java and Rust, and finally I talk and show you how we can integrate Rust code within Java, right? So before we get started, let, let me introduce myself. This is Mo, and I got my PhD in cybersecurity in 2020 from University of Potsdam. This is my web page. Here you can find cooler stuff about tech and I know, daily life and things like that. You might find some interesting stuff there. This is my blog is growing actually fast and I have like talks about security, about niche stuff, you know, things that I personally experienced by myself and I share with you guys. So it's like a, from an engineer perspective, not, not necessarily from things that you hear online. And people talk about that is like people who really work on the stuff and they got the nitty gritty of a thing and share these things with you guys. This is my YouTube channel, you know, as you guys probably watch me there uh, from Hipsip. I actually made a version of this talk for the Java Zone 2024 in Norway, which is very actually a high level conference in Java. So I was invited as a speaker and I actually gave a talk about that. And this is a version of that basically for you guys, you know. And you can find also the codes and instruction and details and everything else like on my blog, YouTube and my GitHub, you know, I put the instruction there, how you compile the code, samples and things like that when you're interested. If you're interested to be connected, you can find me on LinkedIn. And if you have any questions and especially if you have like an idea and things like that, you can drop me an email. So before we get started, for those of you who might not be very familiar with Rust, just let me give a recap and introduction about that. What is Rust? So Rust is like an safe, a statically type safe language, like Java basically. That being said, you know, when you define a variable or expression, the type of that, for example, integer, string, you know, things like that, needs to be clarified, determined during the compilation time. Otherwise you can't compile the code. So it's similar in that sense to Java. So, but this is more a system language, you know, it's like alternative to C and C++ because it give you almost pretty much the same level of performance like C and C++ because they are powerful, mighty languages and they allow you to, you know, work with uh, hardware and operating system very close. But the common issue like in C and C++ and other low level languages, is memory violation. You perhaps heard about stack overflow, pointer dangling, you know, a lot of memory violation, things like that, which is quite common actually in uh, and uh, what is that in uh, C and C++, but, but this is uncommon in Rust. So Rust is a safe option for that. And actually it's quite popular in different things. You know, you can use Rust not only for system programming, but also for blockchain programming like Solana, Polkadot and other ecosystems. You can use actually Rust for web development, even for web development, APIs, web APIs, for op designing operating system and many things, many cool stuff like that. And uh, the other thing is, you know, uh, it has an enhanced memory safety and error detection system in place with the help of uh, ownership and the bottle checker. And uh, one, you know, side point here for you guys, this is, uh, Rust is based on the LLVM, you know, infrastructure. So LLVM, if you know LLVM, is a very mighty uh, compiler design tool chain, allow you actually to make compilers and save compilers. Languages like C Lang also are on top of LLVM. So Rust is on top of LLVM, and that means a lot of good stuff like code optimization, binary optimization, you know, security checks and things like that actually happen with the help of LLVM. And uh, there is actually a big distinction between Rust and Java. 
in Java, when we have a lot of memory in order to remove the ch uh, junk memories, you know, and uh, clean up memory and, and enhance end performances, we have a component, a runtime component introduced by the JVM or Java Virtual Machine. It's called uh, Garbage Collector or GC. So GC frequently at runtime scan memory of your code and see if you can actually, if you don't need a reference, you don't have a reference for an object, then remove and kill that object from memory. So release that memory for us. And that's actually give, you, give us a clean, you know, memory. But because this is happening at runtime, it introduces overhead. And sometimes it actually downgrades the performance. And sometimes it actually causes security issues as well, as I show you later on this slide. Whereas in Rust, we don't have those stuff. We have everything, I would say most of the thing happen during the compilation time, at compile time. So it's like a GC by a compile time. So it's really nicer, you know, it's faster because it happens during the compilation time. Otherwise you don't get the binary. You don't need to do it at runtime. So how, what's the security model of Rust? You know, I talk about that in previous video and a slide on my papers, if you follow me on. So, but let me give you some intro if you're first time in hearing that. So Rust actually has two main concepts, you know, ownership and type system to guarantee its security. So ownership says, hey, any value you have in the code has an owner. And if owner go out of a scope, out of block or something like that, then I release memory no matter what. And the component that force this type system and ownership, the entire thing is called borrow checker. I mean, in a nutshell. I mean, of course, there are many details, but you can watch my previous videos for details of borrow checker and things like that, or read my articles and other sources, basically. So borrow checker is, is provided, you know, the memory. So it's like an alternative to GC, but this is a static one, compilation, during the compilation time. And it's called, yeah, it's, uh, it's much more faster. And um, that make your binary at the end actually much more faster. So in order to better understand, you know, one of the distinction between Java and Rust, let's have a look at the simple Java code. You know, I can actually tell you what's going on. This Java code, we have a class called person. We have two fields, name and age. We have a, um, basically a construction method person that make an object, you know, assign the, uh, the values, the the arguments to the fields, the private fields, and then we have uh, the grid, you know, method or function here that just simply uh, print the stuff in the console, you know, just name and age. Then, you know, at line two, we have the entry point, <coughs> uh, sorry, uh, in our main class, and here at line three, um, we make an instance, make an object out of this class, we pass Alice and 30 year old, and then we print this out. So when we go toward the line seven, end of the scope, the garbage collector actually check behind the scene, you know, the memory and say, oh, okay, I don't, you don't need person anymore, right? We didn't release anything. We didn't manually remove anything. But garbage collector actually analyze and understand that we don't need person anymore and remove that from memory. So in this case, in case of Java is heap, you know, the heap part, part of memory. So remove that. That's how basically garbage collector understand that code and remove it. So let's see if I handle and convert the same code into Rust, what happened? So in Rust, I make an struct called this person, similar to like class, but here we use a struct. We have two fields, name, string, age, uh, unsigned, um, integer 32 bit. Then we have the implement uh, block, actually implement that, make a instantiation, new, make an object out of that, and greeting, which is a self-reference, and print that same thing, you know? And the entry point here is the main function here, at line 20. And in this block, we make an object out of the construct person, pass the arguments, and then we call the, uh, the grid function or method here. And then memory would be deallocated because the person, the owner of the data actually goes out of the scope, right? So this is how during the compilation time, the borrow checker actually figure this out and actually release the memory for us. Very similar to GC, but very similar to Java, but the thing is, it doesn't happen at runtime. It happened at, uh, during the compilation time. So it's a runtime thing. Whereas for Java, it's a each time thing. Each time we run the process, it should happen. This, this uh, analysis should happen by the JVM. So that means each time you have like two processes, you know? So each time you have more per uh, performance overhead. Whereas in Java, in Rust, you have just a one-time binary which is optimized. And that's it. That's why you're much more faster and memory optimized, you know, using Rust. So key differences from my understanding are in three sections, memory management, performance implications, and safety guarantees. So in terms of memory management, Java relies on garbage collector to handle memory stuff at runtime. 
Whereas Rust use ownership and bar checker and everything happens during the um, compilation time. So we don't have garbage collector. Therefore, our code is much more faster. It's not like, um, you know, there is no extra processor at runtime. Performance impl uh, implications, you know, garbage collector can introduce latency and unpredictability. I will show you actually in terms of even security problem and hacks and DOS attacks, how actually uh, GC contribute to that. And uh, whereas in Rust, we don't have it because we don't have garbage collector and the result is predictable. And safety in Java, which is actually much more safe than Ra and C in terms of memory leaks and null pointer exceptions, point dangling pointers and those kind of problems. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with that, I would suggest search about them uh, or uh, watch out my previous video and my blog because I talk about dangling pointer and null pointers, memory leaks and things like that in details. Um, so with the help of garbage collector, you try to remove those issues, but still you have it, as I show you later on. Whereas in Rust, we have very strict memory model and we have runtime overhead. So that reduces the chance of bugs such as, you know, um, not pointer dereferencing and buffer overflows. So I would like to ask you, you know, pause the video maybe, take a look at this code, understand how it works. And tell me two things. What do you think? I mean, you can just think about it, you know, write the comment. Do you think the code can be compiled? If yes, the second question, can you run that? And when you run that, I mean, if you can compile that, you can run it. But what happened? What would be the outcome? Maybe you can pause the video, think a little bit about it because it helps you a lot to understand the point I'm trying to make here. So I uh, assume that you thought about that and if you compile this code, it actually compiled perfectly, no problem from the compiler, you know, no warning, nothing like that. But if you run this code, you get null pointer exception here. And the reason why here is you have a class test, you have a string uh, in your code, basically, you have a string text and it's null, you know, and then you pass this null string to um, this null, basically, value to, to print uh, to the print len function within the function, try to get the len of this, this uh, argument, you know, s. And because this is null, we don't have len. And here, compiler actually crashed, you know, and the code crashed and, yeah, stopped, you know, and show you you have an error. And, but if you just port the same thing, the very same thing, without having security knowledge, just to Rust, here, Rust actually handled it for us. So in Rust, we don't have actually null. We have none instead of that. So in order to use that, for example, when we deal with a string, we know that Rust actually force you to say, hey, you need to use um, the, the type option. And in option, the type option, we have two conditions. You know, we either have something or some, we have some value, some string, or we have nothing or null. We call this none. So you have to use that even if you don't have security, you know, background. And then it forces you to use match to make sure you can you consider both conditions, you know. And by having that, if you compile and run that, you don't, still is null, you know, it still is none, but because Rust forced developer to, and use actually the uh, option type, uh, you never get actually any errors. You just, you have, you are ready, your code is ready for the non condition or null condition. I give you another example here. So here we have a Java code quite simple you know we use the multi-threading feature and try to have um let's say um um try to have a um yeah yeah a counter you know we have a counter class simple counter class we increment that we get the count and we have a private variable count so in the method main we have two thread and each of those actually count until 1000 so we expect actually at the end, the uh, line 29, the, the outcome we get, we expect to be 2000, right? 1000 here, 1000 thread one, 1000 thread two. So this is the logical thing. You know, if you think like that, the logic is correct. But what happened? What do you think? What do you get? You know, we can pause the video and a little bit think about that. What's the catch here? Why I put this here? So I continue, I assume that you did this. If you run this code, you might get 2000 but you may not get 2000, you might get 1875, 1920, and things like that. And this is called race condition. So that's source of evil. I would tell you from my experience, many of these so-called safe progress, uh, projects, you know, and system code and something like that, 
they might be actually prone to race condition error which is very tricky and actually even in security aspect it could be really end up in DOSing of a service you know you can just trigger something trigger you know change the pattern of threads and it actually screw up the entire system and it's very difficult to trace them down because actually sometimes you run them and they work properly you know if a developer you run that maybe a couple of times and everything is okay but you run that in 100 time and then 101 actually you got the error and it caused race condition and crash so why race condition happens because you know two let's say two or multiple thread try to access to the same memory location in this case is count and they write to write and read you know they they read and they write to write information and so they are in a uh, unsafe manner competing to basically write something in count and they can't get it all the time and as a result we have a unproper non-proper synchronization here and that actually leads to this so if you are a default java developer and you this logic logic is true but you get actually race condition i mean I imagine this is a simple scenario what happens if you have a project with multi uh, medium line of code you know it would be very tricky to find this stuff but if i just port the same code in rust this is the actually equivalent of the same thing you know and see how rust beats actual race condition within its um, internal um, capabilities so the same code here if we do that we compile that and we run that even if do it but for most you know i uh, want to show you down here when you run that no matter what one time one thousand time one million time one billion time you still get 2000 is straight, not less, not more, you know, and this is because in Rust you have to use synchronization in your code and this happened with using the sync, you know, um, package, you know, use Arc especially and Mutex that guarantee the share uh, space within your, with the ownership of your space. And this, this simple code alone here actually guarantee, you know, your, your safety. So you always get that no matter what. And that's the beauty of you know, using Rust. So you don't need to be like a security expert. Just by following you know, the, the built-in capabilities, you you know you will get the security. Because STD, you know, they are this these packages, they are like built-in you know, packages of Rust. So nothing extra, no extra knowledge. Always you know synchron synchronized, no thread issue. So Rust actually promises you know security in, in multi-thread ecosystem. And this is the last one, guys. Take a look at this. Obviously, here we have a memory leak issue. But how it happened? I give you, you know, you can pause the video and think about it. All right, so let me explain you how it happened. So if you run this code, you get out of memory error. So why it happened? I give you the scenario. So like I said, you know, uh, GC, or the garbage collector in Java, is responsible to relieve memory, you know, to release the part of memory we don't need it, to deallocate the memory space, junk space. So here we have an infinite loop in a wide through part. We have an array list big data, you know, and then we go to this block of infinite loop. And each time in each iteration, we got like 1 million integer and we add this array to the big data, right? And we do it for unlimited number, infinite, you know, time. And uh, here, the garbage collector tried to release, you know, data. I said, okay, I don't have a space. JVMC heap is actually consuming very fast and yeah, we don't have enough space. And garbage collector try to actually deallocate memory space because it's it's just fed up by one million integers in each iteration, but it can't. So the catch here is this is a kind of principal problem in, in GC. In GC, in order to remove an object from heap, we look at uh, the reference of data. We, we want to see if this data is the reference is still valid and data is still reachable or not. If the reference is valid, then it doesn't remove it. If it's not valid, then remove it. In this case, it's valid because we add 1 million integers each time to big data, which is actually still valid, even at the end of the uh, loop, uh, you know, block, right? And therefore, data, all the data added before are reachable and reference are valid. Therefore, GC cannot do anything about it. It tried to remove memory and it tried to attempt actually harder but what happened, we, we go out of memory and actually the, the code crash and GC can't do anything, actually it downgrades the performance. So that shows you know, the complexity of using GC you know, here. And just imagine what happened in real world scenario in much more complicated you know, cases. All right, so if I port the same code again to, to Rust, I have this loop, you know, I allocate 1 million uh, in each iteration 1 million integer with the default value of zero 
and then I have drop. So this drop, I actually put this intentionally here for you guys. Drop says, okay, I don't need the memory anymore because the owner, which owner of data, owner of this array one million integer is zero, is data. And data is going out of a scope, you know, out of this end of the loop, I don't need it, you know, it's going out of a scope. So based on my principle, I remove it. And it basically performed drop, you know, drop function. So I put this explicitly for you, but if you remove that, still it works and it still works the same because the compiler in Rust actually add this behind the scene. And that's the beauty of that. So you don't need to know shit about, you know, like this um, basically issue and Rust actually handle it for you. So now let's talk about the Rust Java integration, how you can actually bring Rust code into Java, you know. There are multiple, multiple ways you can do that. But in this talk, I'm talking, I'm introducing two ways, J and I and FFI. So J and I, which stands for Java Native Interface, which is a basically um, Java, you know, JVM built-in capability, allowing a Java code to interact with non-Java code, like a system code, like a library, like an operating system, things like that. Rust code, uh, C code, and things like that. So we want to use that for Rust. The other way around is using like foreign function interfaces, libraries like that. And those are basically like JNA and JNR are basically just wrappers, are just libraries. They also, at the end of the day, they take advantage of JNI. So they are the same thing, but uh, it's, it's much easier. So when actually you wanna use that? And let's first talk about JNI. So it's pros and cons, and then you can make, have a better picture about which one is the better option for you in your case. So JNI, your Java Native Interface, it has some advances, you know, like performance. So JNI allows direct method call to native function like C or Rust. Minimal overhead, you don't have too many layers, too many ab abstraction in middle way, you know. You don't need extra, uh, external libraries, anything extra. So things are good and you have a lot of capability. You have control, you have much more control, you know, to your, um, to your non-Java non side. And that allows to, I don't know, do more tuning, do take advantage of the host system, do more low level stuff. But it comes with some cost, you know, it's complexity because you need to do that. You need to take care of, you know, library, header libraries, and uh, you need to be careful about functions and signatures and many other stuff that is not really cool, especially for maintenance, because if you're developing a new product, and you have a lot of back and forth work, then it would be a headache, it would be over time. Whereas for J and A as an FFI library, it's easier to use. We have wrapper around that, so make everything easier, less complexity. You don't need to have like uh, native headers. For, uh, and yeah, so that's one level that you reduced, uh, is reduced for us. We have dynamic linking, so uh, it allows to have like dynamic link to native function that allow to have better, you know, development, easier development environments. You can develop a stuff on the shared library on the Rust side and integrate that much more faster and easier into, um, into your Java code. But it comes with performance overhead because we have like extra layer of um, uh, abstraction here. You have less control, you know, like always. So it really depends on your, this is like a design um, decision, you know. If you need some stuff to do like, I don't know, graphic rendering or something that milliseconds matter, then JNI. If you design something that millisecond um, doesn't matter, then JNI or J FFI library in general. So let's actually have a case here together. I mean, I in a separate video, I will talk about that, how to make a, uh, how to do it basically in practice, like a live demo, but here I just put the uh, structures. So in terms of how we can integrate ROS to Java with the help of J and A, so for, we have four major steps. First step, we need to implement a thread set count in ROS. This is actually what we did, so we can use that code you know, here and just make it more compatible as a um, shared library. Then we need to compile this code as a library, as a shared object. And then we can define Java interface for that J and A. And then we can actually create a Java class that use that Rust library via J and A interface that we made it. So thread safe library here. So I quickly actually explained the code, but you can find it on my GitHub and description here. And also in a separate video actually where I will do it, you know, live. So we have two important things, you know, two, those two headers on top, we have arc and mutex. We already talked about that, that provide the save and uh, provide the secure, you know, uh, safe uh, thread, uh, multi-thread, you know, environment for our concurrent code. 
and uh, we use Arc and Mutex for that. And we have also Seavoid, which is actually for using JLI and, and exporting the library in other application. Then there is a, actually no mangle attribute here. No mangle say, hey, Ross, please do not mangle the function name. Why you don't mangle that? Because I want to use that in like Java or other languages, external languages. And the, the guy over there need to know the function name, all right? We need to know the function name properties. We need to find the function signature. So don't mangle it. Then we have arc new and we have like our box new actually and uh, um, the box from row. So the job here using box here is, is to basically because pointers in ROS are quite safe. You know, we don't have dangling pointer and so on. They're not like pointers in C. They can, they can point everywhere they like, you know. So because we are dealing with the external environment, our pointers are safe. So we need to convert them first to raw pointer and then from raw pointer later on to save pointer when we deal with interact with the external world. So you need to have this code and then on the right side, you need to add this um, string uh, to your cargo file, you know, to say, okay, this is a shared library. And finally, you can compile that with this switch cargo build release library. Then you have your binary in your release function. And then on the Java side, first you need to define an interface for J and A. So, I mean, first you need to import actually in the down below, you can see the dependency to your POM XML, which is like a Maven, Maven file of your Java environment. It's like the cargo of Rust, you know, it's automatically. So first you do that, then you have it. And then you make an interface and interface say, I want to load the native load, native library. Here is Rustlib or whatever you name your Rust library. Then you uh, create a uh, pointer, you make the pass the pointer, then you get the pointer and finally destroy the counter or destroy the memory object on your side. Therefore, you don't get any memory leaking issues. Then you use basically create your own, the final class that where you can actually use the counter. Very simple, you know, you have the interface here and you pretty much just uh, do this and use your code here, use the same function name and function signature here you got to be careful about that and that's it you know i hope you enjoyed this talk if you want to know more details about like coding and stuff i actually presented that at zone 2024 as a speaker there as a long talk there are much more details there uh you can check out my git you know my youtube of course you know subscribe follow this description and so on and my blog especially i put all the details and structures there i put actually videos about the niche things that they might be useful for like senior engineers so by learning this stuff, actually can enhance yourself to become more senior, more advanced engineer and understand how to do things that usually people don't do. And yeah, you can gain a lot of power here. I hope you enjoyed this video. Have a good day. Bye.